and turn to the book of James, chapter 5. We'll just finish out the book of James today. As we prepare for communion, uh, we're looking at the end of James, this kind of final word to the church that he's writing to. Um, It's as if he wants to to, to squeeze in a last-minute plea uh, to connect with the everyday issues that we all have. Um, He gives some great messages throughout the book about practical faith, right? Remember, James is the show-me book, I called it last week. Uh, Show me your faith, you know, live out your faith, make it very practical, Uh, if you say you love, then show that you love. If you say you're committed, then show that you're committed. This is James, right? At the very end, he is not going to, again, he's going to go back to a very practical, everyday thing that we all face. And you'll see it right here in verse 13. He starts with this kind of rhetorical question. Is anyone among you in trouble? Well, we all get into trouble every now and then, whether it's, you know, not necessarily uh, bad behavior trouble, but some kind of troubles happen. So is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make them well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if any of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring them back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the way of error will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Uh, there are three ways that God answers prayer. Ready? You know this. There are three ways. Sometimes God answers prayer right away. Right? Like, it just... I, so when I was... Um, Nine years old uh, in East Texas, uh, this little town uh, near the Texas-Louisiana border where I, I grew up till, till junior high school. My dad was a police chief in the town, and uh, we had a house just right up the road from the police station, actually. And uh, we loved that house, still love that house, um, uh, older house, but a little brick house. And we were in the living room, and... Um, I really feel like I had just recently really sort of uh, discovered my faith. You know what I mean? I I feel like I came to Christ maybe just a few years earlier than that, but I I really felt like I was getting into actually reading the Bible and uh, getting interested in what it said, you know, as a a nine-year-old kid. I I had good Sunday school teachers, and I had folks who really helped me to, enjoy what the Bible says. And so I'm, I remember reading this stuff about if you pray and believe, God, God will do it, you know? And so uh, we had a blackout, like the lights went out, you know, which happened every now and then in those small towns. I mean, so the lights were out and it was daytime and everything. But we had this big lamp that that had this sort of round base to it, this round red, almost jewel looking. It wasn't jewel, it was just a lamp, but this jewel like base to it, and it was a lamp. And so, <clears throat> honestly, I, I'm not. I wasn't trying to be a faith hero or anything. I was kind of trying to freak my brother out a little bit. <laughs> he was seven, <laughs> and so I said, I. I I believe that God can just turn on these lights right away. This was, I don't know. So I put my hand on the lamp. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed that I did this. I was nine. And I said, in Jesus' name, these lights should come on. And I'm not kidding. I timed it just right. Somehow, the lights came back on. 
My brother stayed away from me for two days. I freaked him out. He, I would come near him like this. He'd be like, get away. Get away from me. I, I, honestly, I think that was more coincidence than it was. I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying God can't do that. I've seen God, though, since then, do things that seemed instantaneous. Where you pray and, and it's just within a short time, God does it in answer to prayer. I think those are more rare. But I think they happen. I believe they happen. I, I've seen them. You, you've probably seen them. So, so that's one way that God answers prayer. I think the other was just me being a, a silly nine-year-old trying to freak my brother out. But, but I think there are other opportunities where God just really does something instantaneously. That's the, that's the first way. Those are called, to me, I call them right away answers. You know, these answers that come right away. They, they're what we normally call miracles. But there's two other ways that God answer prayer, answers prayer that I think are equally miraculous. They just take longer. Okay? They're still from God. They're still miracles, therefore, but they take longer. Okay? So the first kind is kind of the e- easy kind. You know, it's like happens pretty quick. And you're like, well, that's probably God. I mean, that's probably God doing the right away answer. But the second way God does it, I think, is through a process. And that process most often involves others working with us, through us, around us, right? And you know what I'm talking about there. John Wesley once said, God God does nothing except in answer to prayer. In other words, God expects his people to pray so that God will demonstrate his goodness and mercy. There's another place, though, where Wesley says there are some prayers that God will only answer when they are prayed corporately. How about that? That means there are times when it seems that God waits for his people, plural, to pray so that he can demonstrate his love and power and glory and grace to more than just one. Still with me? I mean, I think the Bible is full of that. In fact, that famous passage that we quote often about nations where in Chronicles where it says, if my people, right, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, remember, and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. We, we forget that that's a, that's a plural prayer. That's a corporate call. He doesn't say if a person. He says if my people. So there are some things that God does through a process, and that process almost always involves more than just one person. It's not that God can't do it that any other way. It's, God, it's that God chooses to do it through this process. And that process may involve doctors and nurses, right? It may involve counselors. It may involve groups of people. It may involve you, me, individually struggling until someone enters into our lives, whether it's a close friend or a spouse or maybe even a stranger, and starts entering into our lives and says, let me pray with you about that. Let me hold you accountable on that. Let me work with you on that. And God uses that process and those extra people to do a miracle. Right? So that's the second way. Third way is the toughest one. It almost sounds like a cop-out. But I really think it's true. I think the third way God heals is ultimate healing. It's called ultimate healing. Um, there was a song that came out, I want to say in the 80s. It's a Christian song. Two great singers, Wayne Watson and Sandy Patty. They were great singers. Um, <clears throat> it was written by Wayne Watson, who was a Christian singer, still, still around. Uh, good songwriter, good musician. He was praying for a friend of his who had cancer. And Wayne Watson and his wife were friends with that guy and his wife. And, and so they stayed in touch with one another. And they, they kept praying together. And they kept believing. And they kept struggling with this cancer that just wouldn't go away and was getting worse and worse. But they prayed and prayed with each other and for each other every day. And uh, the man passed away. 
And Wayne Watson and his wife went to the hospital right after they heard the news. And the wife was still there crying and talking with the doctors about what had happened and how he didn't make it through the final surgery and all that. And the songwriter, Wayne Watson, said, I, I told her I wish I had an answer, but I, I just don't understand. We prayed and we prayed for healing. And he said, she looked at me and she was crying and she says, well, I don't like this either, but I know for sure that he's healed now. And so Watson writes this song and the song is called Home Free. It goes like this, home free eventually at the ultimate healing will be home free. Um, I like though that the, the, the song starts out this way. It's very honest and confessional. It says this. Here's, here's the beginning of that song. Ready? He says, I'm trying hard not to think you unkind. But Heavenly Father, if you know my heart, then you can read my mind. Good people underneath the sea of grief, some get up and walk away. Some will find ultimate relief. That's the ultimate healing that I think God does. I don't know... I don't know how God sorts that out. <laughs> if I did, I'd write a book and be famous. Uh, <laughs> but nobody knows exactly how God sorts that out. But, but here are a couple things we can learn from these three ways that God heals. And we see it here in the book of James. First of all, no matter what we're going through, no matter what kind of healing we need, it begins with bringing it all to God. Is anyone in trouble? Let them pray. Let them just stop and bring it to God. Again, we as Christians historically believe that God really wants to hear what's going on in our lives. Even though he knows it, we believe he wants to hear it from us. Amen? Still with me? We, that's called prayer. We really do believe that. In fact... The great Christian writers throughout all of history from the very beginning have said you need to have a time and a place to pray. For Susanna Wesley, remember, with her bunch of kids running around her little house, she sat in the corner and threw her apron over her head and called it her prayer call. That's all she had, but she had a time and a place. And later on, John Wesley said, I learned more from my mother about prayer than all from all the theologians in Europe. She would have a time and a place. It begins with coming to this God who loves us and saying, God, I know you know what's going on. I know you know that I'm hurting or that this person is hurting or that this person is sick or that I have troubles. But I want to stop and have a time and a place to deliver that to you personally. If anyone's in trouble, let them pray. Start with prayer. From there, we can celebrate, right? I mean, after that, we can, we can celebrate with more peace. Anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. I mean, let people know. Let God know. Talk to God. Sing to God. Rejoice in the presence and faithfulness of God. It all begins in prayer. Sometimes that starts individually, but it always ends up as a corporate as a part of our corporate expression of worship in other words we come together on sunday small group or big group doesn't matter we come together as part of a bigger tapestry that god is weaving and each one of us brings our stories and our troubles and our and our praises to that tapestry and god weaves it together and from that you see this bigger picture of his faithfulness of his mercy of his love of his ability to sustain us through the toughest times. I really do believe that, folks. That's why I come to church. <laughs> Not just because I'm paid to be here. I, I, I come because I believe in what I just said. I believe it starts with prayer, and it, that prayer individually becomes a corporate prayer, and we begin to find comfort and hope and peace as the people of God join us in our individual troubles and celebrate with us through our individual victories, okay? So it starts there. Second thing I learned, final thing is this. 
It doesn't just end with me coming to God personally. God heals individually, but I think God heals most of the time corporately. That's why we really do believe in gathering together, whether it's on Zoom or <laughs> whatever it is. We believe that somehow the people of God coming together, especially around the table of the Lord, is a time of healing because there are things that God only does in answer to prayer, and there are things that God only does through corporate prayer. That's why we have a time of praise and sharing and all that. You know that. It's not just... I mean, part of it is, I mean, information. I mean, we get information about something we didn't know when we share these things out loud. But, you know, the main thing we do is we corporately are lifting up our prayers to God who loves his people and who does some things through the body of Christ together in regard to healing. So that's why James says, if you're sick, call the elders of the church together and, and pray together. Right? Let them anoint you with oil and lay hands on you and, and pray for you together so that that is lifted up to God. And those prayers, God does hear. God does listen to. The prayer offered in faith allows the Lord to raise them up. Oh, yeah, he says, if they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. I'll, I'll just throw this in as, as it could be its own point. It could be its own sermon. And I almost thought about making it the point of the sermon, but I'll just throw it in as an extra <laughs> today. And here's the extra. A part of that healing process involves accountability with one another as well. There are some sins that you and I cannot conquer unless someone helps us. Right? You still with me? There are some struggles that you and I can't get through unless someone in the body of Christ helps us through it. That's apparently true. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to call the elders together and to confess our sins one to another. Okay? Now, yeah, I know. you got to be careful who you confess your sins to. You don't want them gossiping about you all over town or whatever. I know that. I get it. But when we have those trusted, loving people to whom we're accountable, we can confess, we can be strengthened, sharpened, healed through that process. There are some things that just me and Jesus together, it's not enough. Not that Jesus isn't enough. I'm not enough to fix it in the way I need to obey. So I need help. There are people that I need to call and go, look, I'm really wrestling with this. I need to hash this out with you. I've talked to God about it. And part of God's healing and part of God's uh, working in my life on this sin, on this struggle, on this trouble or whatever, is it involves you helping me. <laughs> it involves us working together. You know what I mean? There are just some things, you know. I, I mean, I, we grew up reading Winnie the Pooh as a kid. A.A. A. Milne, Winnie the Pooh. Right, the original. And there's this great scene where Piglet, little Piglet, right? The the companion of, of Winnie the Pooh, his shadow almost, right? They're sitting there and it says P Piglet reaches over and touches his arm and Pooh says, Why did you do that? He said, I just wanted to make sure of you. In other words, I just wanted to make sure you were there. <laughs> and there are some struggles and even sins. That even though we know God is there, we need to make sure that someone else is with us, walking us through it. God miraculously provides that. He gives us you and me. He gives us each other so that we can be a part of that miracle. Okay? It gives him glory, but it also gives us the kind of stability that we need. I'll, 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 I'll close with this. You may have heard this story before, but I like it. I told you I collect preacher stories and stuff. I, there's this guy I listen to named W.F. Strong. He's a uh, uh, journalist and a, like a writer and kind of a sage old guy. <laughs> you know, he has his own podcast, but each podcast is only like five minutes, which I appreciate because of my attention span. But anyway, uh, it's like these five-minute podcasts, and they're called Stories from Texas, but you know I'm going to love them. And... Uh, 
He's got this great voice, this wonderful voice, this soothing voice. I turn him on, I'm, I'm driving, I'm just listening to W.F. Strong. And uh, he, uh, he ends his podcast, he tells some story, it's usually about Texas, something good about Texas or something historical about Texas. He's a, you know, a scholar actually, but he's also a writer and journalist and all that stuff. And uh, he'll tell some story about Texas history or Texas culture or something strange, you know, Mark Twain and and uh, this Texas writer own land in the same place. You know, he'll say something like, and he'll tell you a story about it. It's wonderful. It's just this five minute story. And he ends every single podcast this way. He goes, Here, here's how it goes. I'm W.F. Strong. And these are stories from Texas. Some of them are true. I love that. <laughs> It makes me happy. I'm like, that guy grew up listening to preachers because <laughs> preacher stories are kind of like that. Like, we tell you, and, and some of them are true. Anyway, this one, I don't know, might be true. I just like it. Anyway, <laughs> it's a preacher story. It might be true. It's about this little kid who, um, <clears throat> who was having trouble sleeping in his bed by himself. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with this. We did. I won't tell you which kid, but oh, ah, it was a tough one. I mean, just anyway, um, he just this particular kid, about seven years old. I mean, six, seven, you know, getting up there at six or seven, you're like, come on, man, you know. But he was wrestling with sleeping alone. He didn't he didn't like sleeping in his bed by himself? So he'd wake mom and dad up at two a.m. and call him to bed. I mean, it was just you know, it's okay, but it just got old after a while. And so they, they got so desperate, they, they told the pastor, they're like, look, pastor, could you help with a Sunday school teacher or something? We need to give our kids something. We, we keep reminding them he's okay, he doesn't have anything to be afraid of, there's nothing under the bed, there's nothing in the closet, everything's fine, just, just it's a comfortable bed, just, we're trying to get him sleeping, what do we do? He goes, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm going to be the guest speaker in the Sunday school class for the kids in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to straighten it out. So he, the, 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 the preacher goes to the seven, eight-year-old class, and he's giving his special little thing, and he starts talking about how we don't have to be afraid, that Jesus is everywhere, that there's nowhere we can go where God is not. There's nowhere we can go, even in our room, even in our bed at night. God is, I mean, you know, Jesus is right there with us. He's He's, he's hanging out right there with us. And there's nothing under the bed, but if there were, Jesus would run it off. And there's nothing in the closet, but if there were, Jesus would scare it off. Because Jesus is strong, and he's always with us, and he's right there. And we don't have anything to be afraid of. And he closes in prayer. He walks out. He kind of nudges the parents on the whip. He goes, I think, we've, I think we're on to something. And uh, that night came around, and the kid slept in his own bed on Sunday night. They were so relieved. Thank you, God. But Monday night rolled around, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, the kid jumps back into their bed. And they're like, son, we, we thought we had taken care of this. Um, we heard that the preacher reminded you that uh, Jesus is everywhere. You don't have to be afraid of everything. And he's like, he goes, he goes, I know that, Mom. But tonight, I just needed somebody with the skin on. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a great story. But here's the deal. There are times, there are times when, by God's grace and mercy, he provides someone with the skin on. That's us. And the prayer offered by the community of God is answered. People are healed. Sins are forgiven. When we confess Sometimes, so always to God, sometimes to one another. We need someone we can say, I need your help walking me through this. God has given the body of Christ the skin to walk with us through our hard times. Not just our pain and struggles, which we, we do need, but sometimes confess your sins one to another, pray for one another that you might be healed. I think ultimate full healing sometimes only comes when we get other people involved through prayer and confession. So as we pray and as we prepare, you notice that we begin our communion response with a confession. 
we confess our sins to God and to one another as we prepare to gather around the table of the Lord. As we do that, though, before we do that, let's pray together. Gracious God, we do have troubles. You've said that we would. In this world, we will have troubles, but you have promised that you have overcome the world. And sometimes that overcoming happens instantly, and sometimes it happens through a process, and sometimes it just happens ultimately through the resurrection of the dead. But it always happens first when we come to you, and also it involves the people around us that you've given us. Help us to take that seriously. If we're struggling with a particular sin and and no matter how often we confess it to you, it keeps coming up, help us to get trusted members of the community of faith involved. If we're going through troubles and we know you're with us but we're still struggling, help us also to get your people involved and help us to be willing to be that for one another, that ultimate healing may happen, that forgiveness and cleansing may fully happen, that we may come to your table at peace and leave here strengthened by your grace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.